<clears throat> so it's already Independence Day here. So wishing you all a very happy Independence Day. Thank you. Let's get started. Om. 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 Sahana Bhavatu. Sahana Bhunaktu. Sahaviryam Karavavahai. Tejasvina Vadhi Tamas Tumavit Vishavahai. Om Shanti 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 Om Parthaya Pratibodhitam Bhagavata Narayanena Svayam Vyasena Kratitam Purana Muninam Madhye Mahabharatam Advaitam Bhradavarshini Bhagavati Ashta Dashadhyayini Ambatva Manu Santatami Bhagavad Gite Bhavatveshini Namostu Te Vyasa Vishana Buddhe Hulla Ravindayata Patra Netra Yena Tvaya Bharata Taila Purnaha Prajwali Tognana Maya Pradipaha Prapanna Parijataya Totra Vetraika Parnaye Nyana Mudraya Krishnaya Gita Mrida Duhe Namaha Vasude Vasudam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardanam Devaki Paramanandam Krishnam Vande Jagad Gurum Sarvatharman Parityaja Mamekam Sharanam Braja Aham Twa Sarva Pape Pyaha Moksha Ishyami Mashuchaha. Every time when I read this last shloka, it reminds me of that word moksha, you know. The word moksha indicates actually, of course, absolute freedom, but it also is very profound in its meaning that it it is about freedom from everything that we think is going on in our lives, you know. So, uh, you know, it is only a mind that creates this kind of attachments and we are actually mukta, we are actually free from all attachments. And uh, I think that's what this word moksha is all about in its at the level at which we operate in the world, it's all about, you know, our attachment to things, our attachment to ideas, opinions, all that. But Krishna is saying, you know, just come to me, get attached to me, and I will make you completely free of everything. So I just thought I'll uh, mention about that. So we are doing the chapter 10 called the Vibhuti Yoga. And uh, again, we're going to come very soon to that section after Arjuna finishes asking his long set of questions. Um, we have finished that section where uh, Krishna is really introducing, reintroducing the topic and talking about himself being that Paramatman. But, uh, Krish but again, uh, Arjuna, brilliant student that he is, is still having his doubts in his mind, but the doubts are getting more and more subtler. And that is where we are going to be looking at starting from today with shlokas almost 11 through 14 or 15, even if we can do that. So it is all about the vibhutis, about the divine glories. And uh, last week in our own uh, reflection time, you know, we had Anand who brought up this beautiful question of if I know that, uh, you know, God is great, and I see uh, the greatness, but how do I know really that greatness, right? So any other thoughts on that uh, question from last time? Because that is exactly where we are getting to in this chapter 10 about seeing that greatness of that Paramatman in front of us. 
and uh, why are we not able to really see in spite of you know that paramatman in front of us is not because you know he's invisible he's actually very visible but we have our own notions on what the world is all about and from that we, uh, beyond our notions to be able to grasp that purity that absolute divine auspicious greatness how way we want to look at the paramatman we are unable to fathom we are not able to get to that mainly because of the clutter and everything that is uh, out there as well as in our minds so that is why i think in sahana bhavatu also when we say peace three times it is actually about removal of that clutter and everything so that we can experience that divinity in the form of his manifestations everywhere so last week we just did this brief review about how um, krishna is wanting arjuna to understand his divine glories and he starts to say that you know even the rishis and devas don't know this is again coming to the point of it is not something that by intellect we can understand and uh, we have to go beyond the intellect so that is what he was saying and then finally in shlokas 4 5 and 6 you know he talks first again you know krishna being who he is the greatest teacher is pushing arjuna to understand his manifestations so he starts off with you know the very subtle aspect because if we can understand the subtle then if we are already there towards the next level of giving up that subtle manifestations to get to the absolute pure self so which is why the shlokas 4 5 and 6 where you know he talks about buddhi he talks about asammoha that is you know the capacity to uh, wade through mass of information kshama dama satyam sukham bhavaha abhavaha all these you know we talked about and then in shlokas 7 to 11 where he really starts to explain about his vibhutis because again we need to have a very subtle mind in order to be able to grasp this subtlety here so you know uh, vibhuti meaning what it is it's just an absolutely this extraordinary manifestation and to understand this actually about 20 verses are going to be given uh, to do that and the result from all this is going to be this our connection to uh, krishna so when i talked about moksha and attachment our attachment has to now shift to attachment to that lotus feet of the lord so how we do that is you know he he's trying to uh, get us into the mood of understanding that greatness that vibhuti of his so the key is actually to develop that vision that uh, to to that vision which is some uh, for us right now only in our minds how do i translate the vision to the manifestation so that is uh, how do we develop this vision so we need to go to really understanding that that paramatman is that complete lead the material cause of this world that paramatman is also the efficient cause you know just like we explained um with the potter and the potter's wheel how it is being used to make the different pots or for that matter in today's world with manufacturing any kind of goods you know everything ultimately is in that paramatman the paramatman himself is the creator paramatman himself is the material cause which is all the materials the paramatman itself is the creator the maintenance and the resolution everything is that paramatman so to get to that majestic power is why he explains in this shlokas all the way from in the in the shloka number 10 you know about machitta madgata pranaha satatam yuktanam so and uh, how he is that knowledge he is that absolute lamp of knowledge so all this is possible when the mind is completely in devotion 
So from seven onwards, he starts to explain those um, those um, uh, different terminologies. So etam vibhutim yogam cha mama yogeti tatvataha so we campaign a yogena yujyate natra samshayaha. So he really gives um, the ability for us to be able to again go from the subtle to the gross. And that examples which I put here um, last week, I think some of the things that we discussed made me ponder upon this. And so I just put a few of these things on how uh, it is not as if um, some things come out of nothing. So that aspect of what we see in the gross form is actually already existing in the subtle in the subtle in, in its in its subtle form. Just like, for example, you know, the seed which has a potential to manifest itself as a tree, so too we can we can start to imagine, and afterwards, of course, imagination becomes a reality when I'm completely surrendered and devoted to that uh, to that uh, truth. So here, the Lord has a potential, which is called the Shakti, to evolve the entire universe. And actually, this power of manifestation is, is called a yoga. It's a yoga Shakti, which, you know, which translates into the Maya Shakti, which Maya is the, uh, Maya is, you can say, the potential for manifestation as this entire world. So, Ishwara has that Maya Shakti, the potential power. And this Maya Shakti, which is in potential form, is actually dormant. And this dormancy is then manifested, manifested in, in its gross form. So just like how we said the seed, you know, when we see a big tree, we don't recognize that this actually came from a, a seed. And uh, another example is the uh, butter and milk. You know, when, uh, how do we get ghee, right? Uh, how do we get the butter out from the milk? It's, uh, in every droplet or globule of the protein molecules in milk, actually you have this essence of butter. But we cannot really see the butter in the milk. You have to really extract it out and bring out. So therefore, the Shakti is there. Just like how we tell our kids, you know, you have the potential in you to do great things. So this is actually the uh, yoga of Ishwara. And later this potential comes to its manifestation. And this manifestation is what is finally visible. So again, I'm putting all this because I was really triggered by the question that Anant asked last time on how do I see the greatness in things? So the greatness is there. The greatness is actually in and through everything we see, but we are unable to see it because our mind has not become pure. Our mind has not yet developed the clarity of thought. So the potential is there. Uh, just like, you know, in physics, how does potential energy becomes, become a kinetic energy? Or how does dynamism come about? The dynamism is, dynas, dynamism is there mainly because the kinetic energy has come from the potential energy. So the kinetic energy gets activated, it becomes actualized. So too, the seed has a potential we do not see to become a tree until it actually becomes a tree, right? So this is the uh, greatness or the vibhutis that is out there. And uh, same thing, for example, if today we have to discuss a lot of this, it did not come from anywhere. It came from really the collective consciousness, the collective thinking that we all are putting it in it, putting in it together in order to be able to even speak today. So this whole thing is all about how the manifest um, you know, becomes visible in its greatness. And that is the greatness of Ishwara that we see everywhere. So I just wanted to put this as a kind of reflection uh, any questions or any thoughts on what else? Maybe this is a good time for us to ponder upon what else do we see as something which is manifest but existed in a subtle form before so that we 
we get into this process or we start to uh, uh, we start to reflect upon the fact that it is not as if something came out of nothing. There was, it has to come from something. And what is that something? And how does that something get, man how does it something get manifest into something which is visible? So can, can we think about some examples? Because this will allow our brain to develop a kind of a process by which we start to develop that devotion. Ultimately, it is that devotion or that um, trust, shraddha, everything that we are trying to develop within ourselves, because it is only that shraddha that finally takes us to the ultimate, which is beyond the world of names and forms. Hari uh, Om, this is, a, I mean, a simple example, I think. Uh, we see uh, uh, lots, uh, we have lots of uh, pictures at, at our house, you know, lots of vigrahams in our house, in our temples. And uh, we see the vigraham, uh, we see the picture and we are so, they are so, we get enchanted by the rupam and the, you know, everything. Someone, this painter or the sculptor, he made the vigraham. They they carved it out of whichever material. It could be wood, it could be stone, it could be metal, gold, silver, whatever. They made they create they made this whole akara, and then they if it I mean and the details that they have added to that akara. If it is a amavarus, it if it is a mata's uh, picture uh, idol. There's so much of detail in that amavarus uh, full uh, vigraha. It's like if we are at times when we are just looking at that vigraha, it is like amavaru is just sitting there and talking to you and stuff like that. But we put in, it's the whole, the raw material was given by, has been provided to us by the law. The right, creator, right. the, is, is a, is a, is a, is self himself. It's the Lord himself. Who, the, uh, the Kala and the Kalakar and everything is the Lord himself. But there are so many different parts to it by the time it comes into uh, i'm i'm right. able to see it there are so many other so many steps have been taken the kala right. and the kala car has sent, sold it to someone else and from there i got it to somewhere else so it just if we see the whole thing as that that whole process you mm -hmm. it's the right. the the uh the Oh, everything that is involved, it is just mind-boggling how much right. what all was involved. And if, right. if there are colors involved, for example, in the paintings, right. like, those paintings, the, those colors, how did they come? What were the pigments that were used? What pigments were missed? It's just mind-boggling how much we can think about on those lines. And it's like, uh, it's I mean, just one idol or a picture can make us think about how much was involved, how much did, how much was given, has been given right. to us by the Lord, and we have taken it for granted. So that's right. a... beautiful, very good, Subarna. You brought in so many different points um, in connection with, I guess, what I was asking is the process that we need to start developing in our own minds. Um, our minds have been so much outward that we take things for granted or we don't even pay attention to yes. the things outside. By yeah. your example, what you just said about um, looking at the pictures of gods in the house, that's where you started. Yeah. And uh, where the pictures of God kind of brought in your mind that um, sense of honest of so many different things in the world like you said you know the colors the the imagination of the painter then how it has been manifested in the form of the painting right so and swami chimananda gives this beautiful example of how you know a very very highly matured artist can actually see a piece of stone 
and uh, imagine or visualize the uh, uh, the sculpture of uh, the divine Krishna or in that stone. For all of us, we might just see that as a stone, but an artist actually can bring out that divinity in the form of an idol from that stone. Right? Yes. So that's another example of um, bringing out or uh, bringing out the uh, in a gross form, so to speak, something which existed in the minds of that uh, artist, right? So I think, uh, again, from last week's uh, question, this week when I was pondering upon, you know, why is it we are not able to uh, see the greatness or that manifestation of the vibhutis of the Lord is mainly because we haven't developed within our mind that uh, process. And uh, that process in our own uh, philosophy or Hinduism is, is about actually the entire rituals that is there, the entire sadhanas that is there. All that helps us to calm our mind down. And it's only in the calmness and when the mind is silent that all these things can get manifest. Right? So beautiful. Thank you for, um, you know, Suvarna for that example, as well as giving your thoughts, because that is exactly where the 10th chapter is leading us to. So this Avikampena Yoga is basically that, uh, uh, that uh, unwavering uh, state of the mind where all the doubts have been cleared and when the mind is completely silent, that we recognize that ultimately, as you also said very well, you recognize that there is something beyond all these painting and that we understand that Ishwara finally is the cause for everything and that everything originates only from Ishwara. So once we are established in that, that is where Krishna says, those are the people whom I call them as the wise people. And they are the ones who really actually look at everything and yet know that it is Ishvara's manifestation. So then in Shloka 8, uh, having said that, you know, he, he starts to tell Arjuna about at the end of the day, this is how I am actually manifested. I am Sarvasi Prabhavaha. Matha sarvam, uh, sarvam pravartate iti matva bhajante maam buddhas bhava sambandhitaha. So this is why he says only the people who are able to see me in spite of all the, um, in spite of all, I just use the word ugliness, I guess, on the world, or in spite of the glamour, the um, all this, beyond that, those are the people who are really this is because I'm the source. So, you know, Arjuna is continuously listening to Krishna say all this. Krishna is giving him all these things to think and you will see how he's asking the question, you know. So then he, uh, this is also another beautiful verse where we saw last time. So finally in Shloka number 10, where Krishna says that, you know, I give them for people who are starting to recognize that, uh, you know, that Paramatman is the cause, that Ishvara is the cause, I start to give them the Buddhi Yoga. Buddhi Yoga, uh, he's, uh, he gives he gives them this ability to develop even cl more clarity in the mind by which they can come even faster to him. So that's why he says, I give them Buddhi Yoga because these are the people who have a very, very steadfast in their contemplation on that reality at all levels of themselves. You know, uh, it is not as if these people um, are only, um, you know, intellectually understanding this. They're actually uh, showing this in the reactions because ultimately what is the uh, proof of the fact that I am evolving? It is not about the amount of actions that I do. Uh, you know, it is not enough if I just go to the temple, say my Bhagavad Gita, say my shlokas, 
do everything, but it is ultimately how I really, really react to situations in the world. So that is what he's saying that those who have become steadfast in the contemplation at all levels of the personality, they are the ones who will be given this buddhi yoga, which is the necessary strength and the ability to walk towards that ultimate. So even, for example, for such people, uh, because of their prarabdha, if their awareness slips a little bit, but he's there to push them very quickly towards, uh, you know, uh, understanding who they are. So that is what is the buddhi yoga part of it. So in shloka number 11, he talks about, again, this is, uh, you know, I want to focus more on, last time we talked about the jnana deepa, but the word tamaha is so very important because uh, it's like, you know, we are really engulfed today with um, this clutter in our mind. Like I started the, uh, 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 the lecture today with, you know, there is so much of clutter going on in our mind, which is this darkness, you know, and this darkness born out of uh, aham agnyanam tamaha, he says, you know, this we are so ignorant of our own true self. And we have thought of ourselves as this Sunita or Suvarna or, you know, and we are so much focused on that identity of us that we are unable to really see our own true self. And this is where actually uh, Arjuna, as Krishna is giving him all this information, his own perception of who Krishna is for him, this transformation from his body to that ultimate Paramatman is slowly taking place in Arjuna's mind. And so that is where this darkness is about. The darkness prevents us from seeing us ourselves as somebody different. And so you know, he's saying that Tesham Eva Anukampartam Aham Agnyanam Tamaha. Nashiyami Atma Bhavasaha Jnana Deepena Bhaskata. So, um, very uh, an important verse because uh, this, again, coming back to Tamaha, you know, a thing actually outside, which is outside you, may sometimes be veiled from our perception. Like, for example, we may be looking at this world as Ishwara, but that fact that this world is nothing but a manifestation of Ishvara is actually veiled from a perception, mainly because of our own mind, that is one, but also maybe some circumstances. Like, for example, when we go to temple, maybe we see the Lord. But when I'm in the world, working at work or at home or anything, I'm not able to see because maybe the favorable conditions are not there for the perception. You know, just like we say, in order for me to hear something, the frequency of the sound should match what I can hear. For example, we know that, um, you know, other creatures can hear things which we cannot hear, right? So it is not sufficient that sometimes that Ishwara's manifestation is there, but in order for that to happen, some other conditions has to be there. It's, you know, like, for example, we say, uh, uh, suppose the room is dark and I keep my phone here and I'm looking for the phone, okay? But uh, the minute I put the light on, then I see the phone, right? So it's not as if, you know, the light made the phone uh, appear. It's just that, the light made the condition uh, favorable in such a way that I could see the phone, right? So this is uh, kind of an important thing. Or uh, imagine, suppose, you know, I have this watch, which actually has, uh, which has, uh, which I can actually, um, I mean, it has a radium uh, in it. And because of it, I can actually uh, see the watch. But then the watch is buried under some uh, books, and I'm not able to see. The minute I remove the books, I'm able to see because the watch has its own uh, illumination and because of which I see it. So I have to mentally remove those blocks from my mind in order to be able to perceive something. 
And that is the darkness that he is referring to here, which is, um, and Krishna is saying that for those people, because I give them the buddhi yoga, and through the buddhi yoga, they are able to easily, able to get, uh, you know, um, they see who I am. Any uh, any confusion here or um, any thought? Not a confusion, but a question, a uh, clarification. In chapter 2, uh, just before uh, the Lord starts the actual, uh, you know, at the starts the Bhagavad Gita and the whole thing, uh, Arjuna actually completely surrenders himself to the Lord. Over there, is it like, is he, uh, he, he has uh, accepted the Lord as his guru, as his teacher. But over here, he's actually accepting him as the Lord, as the Omkar. Is that what where we are going that over there he was just a guru? Over here, he's actually accepting him to be the Omkar, the substratum behind everything. Is that where we are going? That is where we are definitely going. In chapter 2, actually, uh, he did not really accept him completely as a guru. He almost, it was surely out of, um, what should I say? Out, not, um, out of, um, he had given up. You know, it's like um, somebody who is going to commit suicide or something, you know? Yeah. Um, where the person has decided that this life is not worth living and he has nowhere to go. So it was with that sense is how he actually surrenders to Krishna and tells him uh, that, you know, you now guide me, you know. So, but now he's coming to, I mean, all the way up to the 18th chapter. There, um, so right now he's accepting, and uh, he's actually... Not yet accepting because that's the yes. part that we're going to come to. Yeah, yeah. Where uh, he's going to say that uh, you are saying that this is who you are, Krishna. I get it, but yet um, clarify more for me. You know, that's where he's coming to. So he's 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 slowly uh, kind of accepting Krishna as the Lord. You know, slowly he's coming to that. And but he needs more. It's like you know, all of us in the um, uh, science students, for example, we learn the theory of it, but we have to go to the lab and do the practicals and uh, see the colors, you know. So that's again another process we develop, right? Scientific process in students. And is that we show the colors, we show how, I mean, for a chem uh, in a chemistry lab, for example, you have to create the sounds, all that in order for us to get convinced that, yes, there is a lot of heat coming out of this reaction. So that is where Krishna is taking Arjuna now. Very soon, he's going to show those manifestations, not just speak about it. Yeah. So yes. In chapter two, can we say like this? Arjuna was totally shattered and he was in the state of the, the maximum, the utmost confusion. And his aim was just trying to get out of the battlefield instead of... Um, uh, killing all his gurus and all his um, relatives, siblings and families and everything like that. Now that Krishna gave him a lot of, uh, like Krishna gave him a lot of um, uh, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga and everything, he's a little bit stable now and uh, trying to accept La Krishna as his guru. And also, uh, slowly he's trying to uh, think that uh, he's the ultimate and Paramatma. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That is that is true. That is um, that is, um, but uh, there is a lot of, uh, and I keep going back to this word process, you know, which we uh, which we use in the um, uh, in our modern world. Arjuna literally had to go through a process in his mind, and all these uh, yogas, whether it's bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, karma yoga, and actually a lot of karma yoga, a lot of karma yoga is absolutely needed in order for uh, purifying the mind to cleaning up, to take the clutter out of the mind. Only then is Arjuna able to recognize that 
Paramatman in Krishna. You know, even though he sees Krishna as this physical self with his gross eyes and everything, and he's hearing all this, but behind Krishna, in and through Krishna, he is slowly able to recognize that this Krishna is that Paramatman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So now we are coming to the questions. So far, you know, um, as I said, uh, especially where is my, uh, my, I think I had it just in the beginning of seven, you know, uh, from Shloka seven through 11 is where Krishna is really telling, is giving Arjuna the uh, quantities of his true self. Okay. And that is what we have seen so far. Now, what is happening is Arjuna is actually, uh, even though he's now gaining this uh, uh, and understanding this real nature of Krishna as being that Ishvara, uh, but uh, he actually starts to echo all the words exactly how he said. You know, he speak, he'll ask Krishna, you know, he'll tell uh, Krishna, okay, you are the Parabrahman, you are the absolute reality, you are the essence, you know, all this. And, but uh, and he also quotes, you know, just like how, you know, when we write papers and all that, we quote the previous literature that is all there. So he also will quote a lot of the uh, previous rishis who have spoken about it, spoken about him. And then he will, uh, he wants more clarification. So this is actually the first request in the Gita. You know, it's uh, uh, Arjuna is not questioning him. You know, and if it was a question, it would have been actually uh, very short. He would have just said, okay, Krishna, tell me about this. But here, he actually, are, he's requesting um, Krishna. You know, he says, okay, you told me that you are all this. Now, tell me more. Tell me more about, uh, tell me more about who, who you really are. Just, just don't tell me what your qualities are. Because in the Shloka 7 through 11, what we saw was Krishna was just telling him, okay, this is who I am. This is my quality and everything. And just like I said, you know, converting a theory to practicals, you need a lot more to do. You know, you have to have the setup. Uh, you have to have the right conditions, uh, you know, of temperature, all this. You have to have the right vessels. And only then can you conduct this experiment, right? So that is where he's going with over here. So Arjuna Uvacha Param Brahma Param Dhamma Pavitram Paramam Bhavan Purusham Shashvatam Divyam Adi Deva Majam Vibhum. So now Arjuna is, you know, it's almost like he's telling Krishna, hey, you know, you told me about this. And I'm uh, and here it's not like he's saying, you told me, but here he's saying, you know, Param Brahma. Param Dhamma, Pavitram, uh, Paramam Bhavan. You know, you are that supreme Brahman. You are that supreme abode. You are that supreme purifier. So you see how uh, Arjuna is asking this question. And he says, you know, you are the Purusha, that ultimate, the uh, primordial man, primordial human being. You know, uh, Shashvatam, div, uh, divine. You know, you are that Shashvatam. You are that divine person. Adi Devam Ajam Vibhum. You are that unborn and you are that omnipresent. So actually some of these shokas will be going a little fast because you will see that essentially Arjuna is just echoing everything that Krishna has already told him. Okay. And then in shloka 13, beyond just praising him as Ishvara, Arjuna actually uh, gives that background, you know, that literature review, uh, as I was saying, you know, he, he, he actually lists all the names of great rishis like Narada, Devala, Asita, and Vyasa. So he says, Ahus Dvam Rishayas Sarve, Ahus Dvam Rishayas Sarve, Devarshir Naradhastatha, Devarshir Naradhastatha, Asito Devalo Vyasaha, Asito Devalo Vyasaha. Swayam Chaiva Bravishi Me. Swayam Chaiva Bravishi Me. So he's, um, uh, and uh, I'm just using a little bit of the 14th shloka also here. 
So, you know, he's saying, uh, I also know that all these rishis on whom, you know, I have great faith in, you know, so he says, Ahustuam Rishaya Sarve. Thus, all the rishis also, like who are they? They are the Devarshi Narada, Narada, and then Asita, Devala, and uh, Vyasaha. So, these rishis also have actually said, and now, not only have I heard them, but I'm listening from you also, who are, who are standing right in front of me. You know, I believe as true as all this. So, he's trying to uh, show that, you know, whatever Krishna is saying is that now he's also absolutely convinced about it. So, so here he's accepting the authority of the previous one. And he's uh, he's saying that, yes, that is absolutely true. And here the word dev, um, Devaha and Devalaha. This is very important because, uh, you know, Devas, like we said before, are those divine beings. And Devalaha is the, um, essentially the, uh, or the Danavas, they are the hosts of our negative urges in our bosom. So Arjuna being the son of Kunti, is expressing his desire that the identity of his self can be fixed neither by the subtlest nor uh, and the noblest, but also and nor can by the bad in us. You know, so that so essentially, when you when you're trying to uh, explain something, it is only by two methods, either as a friend or a foe. And here he's trying to uh, tell Krishna that I, you know, I think I know that you are actually beyond this. So in shloka number fifteen. Uh, Arjuna is then uh, you would you would think you know okay why is then um, Arjuna asking Krishna to explain it looks like he's already convinced right so what is he asking beyond what Krishna has already said and so this is where that second line of um, uh, 14 is combined with shloka number 15 here he says nahite bhagavan vyaktim vidur deva na danavaha I just explained the word Dhanava here there. Svayam evat manatmanam vetat tvam purushottama bhuta bhavana bhutesha deva deva jagatpate. So he's trying to say that, you know, nahite bhagavan vyaktim. Neither for you, O Lord, bhagavan vyaktim, the manifestation, the deities know, neither the deities. And that is what I meant by, you know, if you have to know something, you would uh, know sometimes by all the good things that people tell about something or about the uh, negative characteristics of it, right? So here, this is where he says, Devaha, Vidur Devaha na Danavaha. Danavaha referring to the demons here. So neither for you, O Lord, uh, your manifestation is known by the deities, nor by the demons. Then, Swayam Mevat Manat Manam, Vetatvam Purushottama. So yourself of the true nature by the self, uh, uh, you know, you you know yourself. You know who you are here. Purushottama, Purushottama, the most the foremost of all people. And who is Bhuta? Bhuta means all these beings. Bhuta Bhavana, creator of all beings. Bhuta, uh, Bhuta Isha, you know, and you are the lord of all beings. Deva Deva, lord of all deities. And you are the Jagatpate. You are the nourisher. So these Lines basically contains about, uh, from a grammar point of view, you know, uh, six sambodhana uh, vibhaktis actually, all showing the greatness of the Lord. So the purpose actually for why Arjuna is asking here is that uh, he's recognizing that, uh, you know, the person who he's seeing is none other than that absolute reality. There's no one to compare him with anybody. And all these beings, they actually rise from him. And so since no one can know this Lord completely, he can be the only one. So that is that is really the beauty here, you know. Because Krishna is saying this, and no one ever can really know the Lord, he has to be that absolute Lord. So, 
and that is why Arjuna is uh, really, uh, you know, uh, so you can see that intelligence of Arjuna coming out here, even though he's seeing Krishna right in front, and the fact that Krishna is talking about the greatness of that absolute Lord, he has to be that Lord himself. So he's kind of uh, accepting that aspect of it. Any any questions or thoughts? Because we'll stop here with this and uh, we will go a little more deeper into some of the uh, meaning of these words, Purushottama, Bhuta Bhavana, uh, next week when we meet. Um, yes, this is uh, it's definitely a little bit where you have to think about from the way I'm understanding is Krishna, it's both the form and without the form. He's going to be talking about both at the same time. So it's like you have to feel it's it's it is like you have to get lost. It's it's it's. I cannot use the words to describe what I'm feeling, but I, that is where I am, that he's talking both about the the form and the Vishwarupa. It's like his form and the formless. He's, he's going to be talking about all of that and just grasping all of it is, is uh, it would be, it would be our moksha if we were to grasp the whole mm -hmm. thing at this. So, that's, yeah, that's... yeah, I know um, your statement is well taken. Um, here we are still so much living in this physical body, which is so finite, which is so, um, uh, which is so confined to such a small space in this entire universe. But we make such a big deal about our finite self. So these shlokas are really bringing us through these words, yoga and vibhuti, to show that we are actually part of a bigger self. And that is in, in the, uh, when we take ourselves as a form. And beyond that, we are even much more because we are not even this form, right? So uh, both form and the formless part of it. And Arjuna is slowly starting to grasp that aspect. And this is the crux of the second half of the whole Bhagavad Gita, which is taking us beyond our finite self to show that we are part of a bigger picture. And Krishna is using himself as an example to tell that to Arjuna. And that is what he said in Shloka 7 through 11. And here, Arjuna is echoing it back to him, saying that, you know, okay, I recognize you are the creator. Bhuta Bhavana. I recognize you are Bhutesha. You are Deva Deva. You are the Lord. You are the essence of everything that I'm using to see this world. You are the sound behind the sound. You are the light behind um, uh, uh, the light. Or you are the prana behind all pranas. Everything. And you are Jagatpati. You are the nourisher of the universe. You are that absolute knowledge also. You know? So all this now you see Arjuna reflecting it back to him. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I'm... Yeah. So we'll continue this a little more on this theme of that connection that we need to establish and that process we need to go through, you know next week. Sarve bhavantu sukhinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhatrani pashyantu, ma kasjit dukkha bhagpave, om shanti 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 hi, om purna madaf, purna midam, purna at, purna mudachyate, purnasya, purna madaya, purna meva vashishyate, Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyo Namaha Hari Om Thank you and we'll see you next week. Thank you so Hari much. Om. Thank you. You're welcome. Hari Om. Thank you very much. Hari Om. Thank you so much. Happy Thank you, Sunita Ji. You're you welcome. have to stop the Bye. recording.
Yeah, I'm going to uh, end. So one second, I can stop the recording.